Easter Sunday, guys. My special guest today is Kim Iverson. She is the host of the Kim Iverson Show. Welcome back, Kim. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Great to celebrate Easter with you. I know it's interesting. Like so many people were like, you know, that Sunday is Easter, right? And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I don't have any plans. <laughs> so I know, right. My husband is going to cook uh, a, a, an Easter dinner later tonight. So we're going to have lamb, you know, which I think is a traditional Easter dish. He's really big on holidays. He already colored his eggs. He did. <laughs> he colors the eggs. He carves the pumpkins. He decorates the Christmas tree. He does all of that every single year. So we have a little bit of Easter spirit going on here. Awesome. Well, you just, someone said in the chat that uh, you just recently had a birthday. I did. Yes. Thanks for bringing that up. <laughs> Once you hit a certain age, the birthdays are not something to, <laughs> to celebrate. Yeah. I just, I just had my birthday. Uh, Thursday was my birthday. Cool. Did you do anything fun? My husband took me to a really, really nice dinner. So I, I did, I live streamed with, um, I li I did a live stream birthday party on my locals channel. So that was a lot of fun. And then later after, and then I did my show. So I actually did, I worked that day. And then, uh, after that, my husband did take me to a really, really fancy, super fancy dinner here in LA at a place called Providence, which is like an ultra, you know, we don't do things like that. I've never been to anything like that in my life. It's like a two Michelin star restaurant. He's a foodie. So he's really into that, but for me, I'd never been into to anything like that ever in my life, and uh, it was it was like art, like the, where the food is tiny, but it's like art, and it was absolutely delicious. It's like amazing that humans can make food that's that delicate, but it's it's a you know we don't, we don't do things like that ever. Normally, my birthday is like karaoke and pizza, <laughs> mm -hmm. but this year we we did do it up a bit, so that was fun. That's awesome. So yeah. I want to start off with uh, with RFK because um, I'm sure you know that RFK Jr. has decided to make his uh, announcement for VP. I want to start off with a little bit, a, a little short clip from that of him making that announcement, and then I want to get your opinion about this. Why I'm so proud to introduce to you the next Vice President of the United States, my fellow lawyer, a brilliant scientist, technologist, a fierce warrior mom, Nicole Shanahan. That, of course, was Robert F. Kennedy Jr. this afternoon in Oakland announcing Nicole Shanahan as his 2024 running mate. Shanahan is a... Okay. So, Kim, you have been uh, pretty vocal on Twitter <laughs> about his uh, pick... Uh, Nicole Shanahan. I, I want to hear from you. Uh, what do you think about him making this choice for his VP? I think a lot of people were assuming he was going to pick someone like a Tulsi Gabbard or Jesse Ventura. Yeah. Or, you know, a Rand Paul would have been a killer ticket um, or a Thomas Massey. Even I mean, there's there's definitely a lot of people out there who I think have been truly fighting the establishment for a really long time. And it would have been nice to see a pair of true anti-establishment warriors get up there on the state, you know, really joining a ticket together. So I've been vocal about this, not only on Twitter, but on my show, much to the chagrin of the people that love RFK Jr. They're, they've, they're still very committed to his campaign, um, not really willing to criticize him. I've kind of given up on him since the Israel stuff. I, I don't understand his his stance and his, his support for Israel, but whatever. Um, this pick in particular, there's two big problems I have with this pick. The first big problem is she's a major top three donor to his campaign. And that just looks like you could buy your way in. So that's not good. Um, whether So let's let's just assume she is the right pick, that it was like a, vet, uh, like a Rand Paul who happened to be a top three donor to his campaign. Even if the person is excellent for the job, it's a really bad look that they're also a top donor to your campaign because it just looks like you could buy your slot into the administration. Very Betsy DeVos and Trump. I mean, very, um, 
we we see this with the swamp. That's the problem with the swamp. One of the main issues is that they just give slots away to top donors. So we don't really want to see that happening in an RFK Jr. administration, especially when he's saying he's fighting the establishment. He's going to be different than the rest. This just looks very akin to being the same as the rest. So that's the first thing. Even if she's great for the job, it's not a good look to select somebody who is a top donor to your campaign. She may be the top donor. Uh, she certainly is a top three donor. Um, the second thing I have with her is one thing that I've been discussing online, on Twitter and on my show, is what I call being battle tested. And this phrase has caught a lot of flack because a lot of people will say, well, Nicole is a fierce mom, as Robert F. Kennedy Jr. said. She's a fierce mom. She has an autistic kid. She's uh, She came from poverty. So she has life tough life experience. That is not what I mean when I say she hasn't been battle tested. It's great that she's had a tough life. Like, you know, that is definitely better than somebody who's just been fed with a silver spoon their entire lives, like Kennedy. <laughs> but it's, you know, so it's it's nice that she's come from, you know, kind of a rags to riches story. Uh, understand that she's got a kid that she's been fighting for in their, in their health journey, their medical health journey. All of that is great. But a lot of people do that. And a lot of people are not aligned with us. They're not aligned just because you came from rags to riches, just because you have a child with medical condition does not make you suddenly anti-establishment. It doesn't make you suddenly wanting to rise up against uh, all the corruption. I mean, practically everybody in California is somebody who's got a rags to riches story and who has a kid with with who's immunocompromised. We heard that all throughout the pandemic. Throughout the pandemic, it was like the Californians who were sitting there screaming, my kid is immunocompromised and you're trying to kill him because you don't want to mandate vaccines. I mean, we heard this time and time again. So parents dealing with children with medical conditions is common in a place, in, in liberal places in particular, because they're more likely to say my kid has a problem than maybe yeah. like conservative areas that are less likely to blame everything on something, right? So that doesn't, and, and she's a Californian, so that doesn't make her suddenly aligned with the anti-establishment populist values when plenty of Californians are not, and they have the same background as Nicole. So when I say battle tested, I mean somebody who has actually gone up against the establishment, has, has sacrificed and been willing to sacrifice against the smears, the labeling, the, estab the, the threats that the establishment gives you. I mean, she has been part of the establishment and then she says on the on the stage, a year ago, a year ago, well, that's convenient, a year ago when COVID was over, right? A year ago, I learned about Bernie and I liked him. Oh, I, you know, I read all these conspiracy theories about him and I thought, oh, but then I met him and I thought, oh, he's actually a great guy. Convenient a year ago to suddenly say, oh, uh, yeah, you know, this guy actually was right. What is difficult is were you with him three, four years ago? Not a year ago. Were you with him three, four years ago? when you were called a conspiracy theorist, when your job was on the line, when you lost family and friends. I had family members not attend my wedding, close sister not show up to my own wedding because of my views on COVID. I lost my job because I because of censorship. You know, there's, there's many people had, that's what I mean by battle tested. Are you willing to hold firm at all odds when you're about to lose everything and when the establishment is coming barreling towards you. I was labeled a conspiracy theorist by the Daily Beast twice, right? They wrote two articles on me calling me a conspiracy theorist. Are you still, when I was on the Hill talking about COVID stuff, are you willing to stand firm to it, whether, and it doesn't matter if you agreed with me on COVID or not, right? It's about whether or not you're willing to be the type of person who's going to stand up against all odds, potentially losing everything because of what you believe in. And we haven't seen that from her. So she's not battle tested. And if you're going to be vice president, that is RFK Jr.'s personal pick for who would stand in as president of the United States if something were to happen to him, which he's fully aware might happen. I mean, he talks about that's why he's asking for Secret Service. That's why, you know, he talks about the assassinations of his dad and his uncle. So you've got somebody who knows there's a real risk of his life being lost battling the establishment. He's had that happen in his own family. And yet his personal pick for the person who would secede him is somebody who hasn't been battle tested. I have a huge problem with that. And it's somebody who then is a huge donor to his campaign. I'm like, okay, well then we just know that whoever writes the biggest check is the person you think can actually succeed you 
as president of the United States if something were to happen to you. Great. So basically no different than everybody else. Yeah, this is what <laughs> this is something that I, I I have been trying to explain to people who are supporting RFK Jr. Obviously, the Israel, his position on Israel and Gaza, obviously. But I've been trying to tell people for quite some time. I'm like, guys, look at where his money is coming from. He's getting money from Bill Ackman. He's billionaire. He's in bed with like the tech bros in Silicon Valley. Uh, she was in bed with the tech, literally. Oh, and <laughs> by the way, all three of her husbands. I mean, and look like. I, I, the, the, the biggest, the biggest outspoken, mo loudest outspoken people I know against Israel are Jewish. So I don't mean this in any like, oh, look, they're Jewish, but they are Jewish. Her, her ex, her three ex-husbands are Jewish. In my three. experience, all three, right. Yeah. So she had the first husband who was Jewish. Uh, she had no children with him, but they got a divorce. And then she married the second guy, the Google guy. The first guy was also rich, but he wasn't as rich. He was like, I don't know, $25 million, something like that. And then married the second guy who was a billionaire. And then she married this third guy who is like on the list for like the best. I mean, he's like on all of these lists of top Jewish people to watch, uh, rising up, you know, very, uh, all three, you know, um, like, and again, that's, that doesn't mean you're a Zionist by any means. Like my, I have the, the, the loudest voices I know against Israel are Jewish people, but mm -hmm. The reality of it is, is that the majority are very pro-Israel. I mean, that's just the numbers. The numbers are the numbers. So the the numbers, the number game is that she's got a daughter who's half Jewish. She has, um, you know, so there is, so she's probably, when you look at, you know, when we're looking at the process of deduction of like how, what's her stance on Israel is the point. Uh, her stance on yeah, looking at Robert F. Kennedy and his stance on Israel is according to Dennis Kucinich, who I just interviewed the other day, who was his campaign manager. Dennis Kucinich says you will not find a stauncher, stronger supporter for Israel than RFK Jr. Why? Who knows? Nobody knows. But he's like their staunchest supporter. So you take that and then you take obviously his VP pick would probably also be a very staunch supporter for Israel would be a deduction to make. And then when you look at her ex-husbands and see that they're all Jewish and that her daughter is half Jewish, you then make a further deduction that she's probably, knowing that most Jewish people are pro-Israel, not all, of course, uh, but most are are pro-Israel, if not full-on Zionist, then, I, which I don't think, in looking at her husbands, at least the Google guy is not. I don't think he's like a staunch, I don't, from what I, I but I could be wrong on that. He might be. He's super secular, but that doesn't mean anything either when it comes to Zionism. So, you know, I mean, process of deduction, she's she's ultra probably Zionist, right? I mean, using those three, using all of those, using those, you know, as the process of deduction. I mean, I'm trying to figure out how you get married three times at her because she's 38. She's well, yeah, the last one is in a technical marriage. They did a love ceremony, but she wore a wedding dress. I mean, it was like. I, maybe maybe it is actually a technical marriage because they might have actually done the paperwork. They didn't call it a wedding. They had a love ceremony, but she was it was like an expensive event. She wore an expensive gown. You know, it was very much like a wedding. I don't know but, if they're okay. technically married. But I don't I don't know if everyone remembers this, but I covered this uh, at some point last year. Sergey Brin, he was subpoenaed by, you know, under the Epstein case. He was su subpoenaed. And then there's that. <laughs> I mean, so it just doesn't look good. And then with RFK Jr., you know, especially with his two trips on the Epstein plane, right, on the Lolita Express, uh, it just so happens that all the people that could corroborate why he was there, why he wasn't there, are dead. Epstein and his ex-wife. You know, that's, I mean, I don't mean to be harsh, but about his ex-wife being, you know, because she is dead. She committed suicide. And Epstein's obviously dead, who supposedly committed suicide didn't commit suicide. Um, you know, it's, it's a very, and then he says, well, I was just there because we were going on like, I don't know, what was it? They were doing, like rock hunting <laughs> trips or something, something odd. Right. Falcon, Falcon something. This yeah. Thing twice. That it, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and with RFK Jr. Having a less than, I mean, the guy, it was a bad dude for a long time. He was a bad dude. There's just no other way to say it. The guy was hooked on drugs he was sleeping around with a lot of women, including while he was still married. He was sleeping with three women a day when he was married to another woman. 
Like, this is not a high moral character at certain times of his life. That doesn't, now people can change. I have nothing against that. Um, people, you know, I, I've been a big supporter of his. I, I, I'm a, I was a big, huge, art with despite his past, because I do think people can change, especially when they get out of drugs. I think drugs are a really bad thing. And that alters a person's decision making. But, you know, you put all that to, especially at that time when he was doing all that stuff and he was on Epstein's Lolita Express twice, that doesn't look good. And then you've got now the, the VP pick somehow being entangled and all. I mean, it just doesn't, it's just adding up to no good is what it's adding up to. Do you find it strange, too, that uh, she actually identified herself as a progressive, which is really interesting, uh, and she's donated to Democrat politicians? Some people uh, on Twitter that were RFK supporters, they said, oh, this just proves that RFK is still a Democrat. What do you think about that? I think it's true that it proves he's still a Democrat. I think it's really clear what he's doing is... So I thought when he chose to run as an independent, which I told him when he was on my show a couple of times, I've, I, I grilled him at one point. And I was like, why are you running as a Democrat? You're never going to, this is like the worst political decision to run as a Democrat. And he's like, Kim, I'm a Democrat. I'm a Democrat. I want to reform the Democratic Party. I'm a Democrat through and through to my core. And ultimately he then abandoned that and became an independent. I thought when he became an independent, when he ran as an independent, he saw a real path as an independent to potentially bust the two party system. With his selection, though, of Nicole Shanahan, it actually looks like he's trying to bust the Democratic Party. So what he's trying to do is he realizes that Joe Biden is uh, like out. Nobody wants Joe Biden. But the Democratic parties in this situation. How do they finagle their way out of that of the sitting president? They can't really do that. Uh, so they're kind of in between a rock and a hard place. And I almost think there might even be there might even be collusion, to be honest with you, between the DNC and RFK Jr., where they're like, okay, we have to play hardball like we don't like you, but in reality, we don't like Biden. We can't have Biden. So what we're going to hmm. do is we're going to, you know, run as an independent. Why don't you run as an independent, gather as much of the popular vote as you can as a Kennedy and selecting a woman of color? You know, this was like obviously a, uh, what do they call it? A, a diversity pick, Right. Because here's somebody that has, which is not bad. She has no experience. We want outsiders. But, I mean, she's clearly a diversity pick. There were plenty of other people that he could have selected who would have been anti-establishment warriors. But he picked a Kamala Harris, you know, cutout, but somebody way better than Kamala for a Democrat. I mean, a Democratic voter doesn't like Joe Biden and they don't like Kamala Harris. Well, now you have an alternative. You have a Kennedy, a historic Kennedy, and you've got... Shanahan, this young, vibrant, you know, uh, loves kit, just everything she talks about exudes something that Democratic voters are going to be really hot for. No, not independents and not Republicans, that's for sure. The fact he selected her, knowing it would turn off every single Republican potential voter, shows to me he's actually trying to topple the Democratic Party, but now he's doing it from the outside. So he's doing what he was originally saying he wanted to do which was change the Democratic Party back to the party, the Kennedy Democrats. He realized he couldn't do it from within. So now he's doing it from the outside. But it's still just a reformation of the Democratic Party. I don't know if I would call it a, a, a diversity pick. I would call it a money pick because she has a lot of money. I think With that's what he's kind of looking at. On top of it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, more of a money pick for sure. Yeah. But how did he go from, I I'm just curious because at one point it seemed like he was going to pick someone like Tulsi or pick Tulsi Gabbard. So how did he go from, <laughs> from Tulsi Gabbard to her? It seems like Tulsi would be more aligned with what RFK platform is. Um, it's just, it's kind of weird to me, but I did see a number of people on Twitter kind of, they were really upset that he didn't pick uh, Tulsi Gabbard. Well, I, I don't think Tulsi wanted to be picked. So Tulsi, the reports were that Tulsi had stopped cooperating with the campaign. So she has instead flipped fully for Trump and she's trying to get the Trump VP pick. And I think the Trump what? people told her, yeah, yeah, she's in line for potentially the Trump VP pick. Um, I think she was told she's a careerist. Look, I, you know, I'm super, Tulsi's my number one disappointment. Um, I mean, RFK Jr. is probably second. I don't know. It's hard to, hard to hard to line them up anymore these days, but she's a big disappointment to me. Huge disappointment to me. She's a careerist. It's very clear. She's just out for political, 
political gain and money, to be quite honest. I have a big beef with her on how she uh, received funding after she stopped being a member of Congress. She started to um, get people over to, a, a, you know, she created a locals community and basically funneled all of the donations she was getting for her campaign, which could not be used personally, instead over to a locals community, which she could use personally. And she was getting... I mean, maybe even close to a million, you know, I don't know, like a lot of money, maybe a half a million. There was a lot of money funneling into that account that um, to me was the thing I hate about politicians is how they become wealthy and they shouldn't be. You know, everybody wonders how is a politician wealthy? Well, they're not really wealthy because of being a politician. They're wealthy because they do things after or during the time in politics in order to make a boatload of cash because that's really what they're all about. And so she really disappointed me. But anyway, I think she's all about um, political success and she's willing to flip flop her positions and her views in order to gain. We already saw that many of us who supported her when she was running as a Democrat in the 2020 election. Um, we made a lot of excuses for her flip flopping, you know, mm -hmm. trying to excuse the fact that she once held quite Republican conservative viewpoints on certain topics or quite um, problematic viewpoints on topics such as torture, such as gay marriage, such as, um, you know, there was several of these types of topics. We made numerous numbers of excuses for her saying, well, she changed, she opened her eyes. She's kind of like what people are saying about Nicole, like, oh, well, she's she saw the light. And so here she is. And then Tulsi now has flipped back. You know, now she's suddenly back to being an ultra conservative and and going back on all the things that we sat there making excuses. She made a fool out of us, made a fool out of a lot of us, out of myself, out of Jimmy Dore, out of, you know, there were a lot of us that she made a fool out of and um, made Anna Kasperian right. You mm -hmm. know, we sat there and defended her against Anna Kasperian, who was smearing her. And in the end, Anna was right. And that was a hard pill to swallow for a lot of us. Um we didn't want to see it because we fell in love with a politician. I'll never do that again. Mm -hmm. And so, okay. you know, Tulsi is in line for Trump's VP pick. So that's, she stopped cooperating with RFK Jr. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I learned my lesson after Bernie Sanders. I said, I can't. No, 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 <laughs> I said, no, 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 no. And then even after, uh, for the 2024 election, all the, like the independent and third party, there are a number of people that said you should volunteer for this. I said, no, I'm not volunteering for any more. After Bernie Sanders, I said, I was done. That's it. Yeah. I'm not doing this again. Yeah, I really, you know, RFK Jr.'s campaign did at one point start kind of putting the feelers out for me, uh, towards me about certain positions within his campaign. And I pretty much told them whenever they'd put the feelers out, I'm not, I, because I, I, I want the ability to turn on them. <laughs> <laughs> if he does something that makes me turn on him. And I didn't, you know, at that point, I had not known, there was no, the, the Israel-Gaza issue wasn't an issue. He hadn't said anything. This was prior to all of that. And I'm glad I, I'm glad I said what I said, which is I, I need the ability to turn on the guy because <laughs> I turned on the guy, you know? He, yeah. he made bad position. He, he's got a stance that I, I think gets us into endless wars in the Middle East. And that's the crux of the issue for a lot of us. He's flip-flopped on some of his policies too. When you spoke to him or when was the last time you've actually had a chance to have a conversation with him? Have you spoken to him since he said that Palestinians were pampered? No, I have not. Mm -mm. The last I spoke to him, I had two conversations with him earlier in the year of last year. So one of them was back before he even announced he was running for president. It was, there was no discussion of that. And then after he made his announcement, uh, he came on my show like that same week basically. And we talked about his policy positions as, as a, as a contender, but we didn't get into Israel. Right. Um, uh, should have. I know. I know. I know. Well, I'm asking because Jill Stein actually uh, tweeted voters should be clear on where every candidate for president stands more than two uh, months into Israel's brutal assault on Gaza. RFK Jr. said that Palestinians are the most pampered people by international aid organizations on the planet. Since then, RFK Jr. has continued his unrepentant, uh, reflexive praise and support for Israel as the death toll has climbed to more than 30K. I am challenging RFK Jr. 
on his assertion that Palestinians are pampered and that Gaza should be leveled. Sign now and tell Kennedy to debate me on Palestine. Yeah. And I wanted to get your opinion. What do you think about that? Jill Stein's awesome. Here's a Jewish woman, right? This is a Jewish woman. And she is telling RFK Jr. who we don't know why he he's a Catholic. So that's not a Zionist. Catholics aren't Zionists. That's not, that's evangelical Mormons. Yeah. There are certain sects of Christianity that are Zionist, but Catholicism is not one of them. So it's odd that he has the stance that he has about Israel. And here's Jill Stein taking him to task on it. Um, he absolutely should be debating her on that issue. I think that she'll be the other largest third party candidate besides RFK Jr. If she gets the Green Party nomination, which I think she will. Um, and so he should actually debate her. I mean, he's unwilling to. He, he He's sitting there upset that Biden won't debate him, but he won't debate anybody else. He refused to be on the debate stage with Jill Stein and others at the um, the what, what is it? The free and fair elections. Yeah, so he refused or he just didn't respond because refused. I know that he said they I mean hmm. they asked him numerous times. I mean failing to respond is equal to refusing when they asked him in person. <laughs> you know, they they've seen him in person. They've seen people in his campaign in person. It wasn't just he didn't respond to an email or something. I mean they tried numerous times and they they had contact with all the right people and he just um, yeah, didn't respond, which is a refusal in that situation when you've got direct contact with the guy. So how is he going to debate if he gets the percentage, which it looks like he's on track to to get there? If he stays to that 15 percent, I think the last one I just saw showed him at an average of nine percent. But if he has that 15 percent come election time, how is he going to debate Joe Biden and Donald Trump? I don't know. You know, and the, the one thing that's really killing Biden, this is what's really interesting is what's real. I mean, unless age is really the issue for people and that it's more about age than it is about Israel Gaza. But a lot of the lack of a lot of people turning on Biden in the Democratic Party have been turning because of the Gaza issue. Right. Um, but that might not be true or they're fully unfamiliar with Kennedy's stance, which is also very possible that they just the the you know the media attention is not on Kennedy and his full fledged support for Israel and calling Palestinians pampered that is something that I think is more within our circle but I don't think that's like a mainstream a mainstream understanding and so people might think they're getting something different by supporting RFK Jr than than Biden but really they're getting way more of the same on that particular issue unless they know that and it really is just about the cognitive decline of Biden which is a gen, which is also a genuine concern that people should have for sure, you know. But, um, but yeah, I don't know. It would be interesting to see them all three debate. I would love to see all three of them debate about that particular issue. And I think surprisingly, out of the all three of them are ultra super supportive of Israel. You have to remember, Trump did move the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Trump's son in law is Jared Kushner, who is very close friends with Benjamin Netanyahu. In fact, he hosted Benjamin, you know, his family. When Benjamin Netanyahu would come to the States, they, he'd stay at the Kushners and Jared would have to give up his room for Netanyahu to, uh, Netanyahu to take over. And, um, you know, very, very staunch, wrote the, Abra the Abraham Accords, which is just like a joke, basically putting the Palestinian people into reservations on their own land. Um, so Trump is not any better, but I guess where Trump is slightly better is he recently did an interview with this Israeli organization. And he's like, you guys got to stop this war. <laughs> like you guys have to end. This is not good for you. The world has turned on you. It's not good. I mean, at least Trump cares about optics. That's like the only thing he cares about really is like, what do people think of me and what are the optics? And so that's like the one thing Trump, I don't think is a supporter of anything but himself. And in, mm -hmm. in this particular situation, that's actually a good thing. Because then when everybody turns on him and says, you're a supporter of genocide and how could you be doing this? And Trump would be like, well, I don't want to be that. So I'm going to change my mind. Whereas these other two are like way more, it seems like, um, interested in the, you know, they seem to be more um, like, I don't know, it's, it's like somehow um, ideological or money driven, well, more money driven than anything. They're both Catholics, yeah. Biden and, and Kennedy. So I think it's got to be money. Right. And why do you think that he did not? He said he would have a conversation with Max Blumenthal, but he never did. 
Yet at the same time, he is willing to go on to breaking points and have this same discussion about Israel and Gaza. So why is he willing, you think, to go on to breaking points and have that conversation? And Crystal pushes back on him about this as well, but he's not willing to have that conversation with someone like Max Blumenthal. Well, I think because Max would, he knows that Max would just um, take it, you know, Max is uh, much harder to debate on that issue than Crystal. Mm. Interesting yeah. times we are living in. So I, I want to get to the free speech issue because I'm pretty sure you've heard about this uh, spat between uh, Candace Owens and the Daily Wire. Also, uh, Ben Shapiro's in the mix here, too. What do you think this means about? conservatives that for, I would say for the past couple of years have said that uh, we practice free speech and you should be able to say whatever you want. And now <laughs> you have the Daily Wire uh, doing what they did to Candace Owens. Do you feel that the right has now lost credibility, at least when it comes to the free speech issue and why or why not? Uh, yeah. I mean, obviously when it comes to this, it, it just goes to show that the right is free speech unless you criticize Israel. I think everybody in this country should start waking up to that um, the issue of, of them and like, why is Israel so powerful? Why do we have anti-BDS laws? You know, there's a lot of that going on right now. I'm sorry. One second. I am, uh, in the middle of a slight emergency that I'm trying to handle. Just, oh, no worries. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> no worries. Yeah, that's all right. Okay. I'm hoping my husband can handle it instead of me. So we'll see what happens. <laughs> um, I think the right has definitely lost, um, for sure, you know, and, and everybody, you know, we have anti-BDS laws. Anti so you're not allowed to support the boycott, divestment, and sanctioning of Israel in 37 states in this country. It was 27 states in 2019. Since 2019, 10 more states have joined on to this most of them in 2021. So, you know, we've got this, everybody in this country should start asking some serious questions about, imagine if that were China, if, if we had these laws again with protecting China. Imagine if the Daily Wire said, you can criticize everybody but China. I mean, people would be up in arms about this. So we need to start asking questions as to why is this foreign Middle Eastern country so powerful that it is the one country, I mean, we have free speech in this country, except with Israel. Yeah. I keep telling people it's supposed to be the United States of America, not the United States of Israel. But it's very clear, like, who comes first? Look at what just happened with Governor Abbott. He just made an executive order that they're going to create safe spaces for you know, for, for Jewish students. And my whole thing is, is like, you were totally against safe spaces for other groups. Now all of a sudden it's okay to have safe spaces. So it is very obvious, I think to anyone who's paying attention that they are choosing to prioritize uh, and no shade to Jewish people, but they are choosing to prioritize a certain group of people over everybody else in this country. And it's just, right. it's, very frustrating to me, especially considering all the money that comes in from the lobbyists, like groups like APAC, all the people that are taking money from APAC. I mean, Jamal Bowman is out there right now on Twitter telling people that Hakeem Jeffries endorsed him and he's happy to get the endorsement. Jamal Bowman is a part of Reject APAC. And I'm like, why are you, why are you bragging that Hakeem Jeffries is endorsing you when he takes a lot of money from APAC, the very thing you're supposed to be fighting against? It's laughable at this point. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's a really, it's a really, um, there's, I, we just really have to start asking a lot of questions about this. I think more, you know, there, a lot of us understand that there's just a huge amount of money and power. And it's not just the APAC lobby. There's people that are not donating directly to APAC, but they're, they are still very powerful and influential, very powerful and influential Jewish people who are very pro-Israel and who will pull their money from campaigns or they'll put money towards, uh, you know, challengers to campaigns. So it's not just APAC. It's like an entire, um, it's like a web of, of people and interests that are aligned on the same thing, which is Israel. And it's really should cause everybody to ask a lot of questions about that where that influence is coming it's it's tricky though because so many of them are americans so they're Amer in fact when israel started as a country um the year that they that they formed as a nation 
was there was a flood of money that came in, humanitarian money that went towards Israel, all of it coming from the United States of America. And it was actually the largest amount of humanitarian aid. It wasn't, I don't know if you'd call it humanitarian aid, but it was like the largest donation that had ever been given ever to any organization ever. And it was fundraised by very wealthy Jewish Americans who, you know, this was before APAC or anything like that. So this was Jewish, just wealthy Jewish Americans who wanted to see the, the state of Israel created. And, uh, and then also non-Jewish Americans who are evangelicals who believe that in order for Jesus Christ to come back for the second coming, that there needed to be, um, that the, the Jews must have an actual literal gathering of Israel. They need to return back to Jerusalem in order for the second coming to happen. It needs to happen literally in the evangelical mind. In the minds of Christian, like Catholics and other groups, it's not literal. It's like, it's, it's like, a, it's, it's like a spiritual kind of thing that needs to happen. But right. for some, it's, it's like an actual literal thing. So there's just a ton of money. And I think everybody should start asking questions on that. And it's not anti-Semitic to ask those questions. And they make us feel like it's anti-Semitic to ask those questions. They make us feel like it's anti-Semitic to call out wealthy Jewish business owners in America or just wealthy Jewish Americans who are donating billions of dollars or throwing billions of dollars around. You know, they make that, they make us feel like, they make us feel like that's anti-Semitic when it's, when it's not at all. It's just fact. It's just the way that it is. Right. And I think that, you know, for people who may not have had this experience, it's true for those of us that grew up uh, Christian, that is exactly what they taught us in church, that those things needed to happen. Uh, so I, I would argue there's probably more Christian Zionists than there are uh, Jewish Zionists in the United States. Are the, the money, right, there are, there actually, that is a known fact. There is a the organization that is not APAC, but it's basically evangelical Zionists, you know, that are supporting the state of Israel. There are, they're for sure more numerous. I just don't know if they're wealthier. I don't know if they have more money. That That's where the numbers and the money kind of, there's questions there. Yeah. One more question for you, Kim. Um, you have covered Jeffrey Epstein uh, numerous times on your show this whole uh, debacle that is coming about now with uh, Diddy and apparently they're claiming that other people could be attached to this uh, similar situation where his house was just raided because of by Homeland Security uh, in reference to a sex trafficking uh, investigation. Do you think there's any possibility, and this is something I've just been running through in my head, that this Epstein situation is actually bigger than what we were told it was. And do you believe that maybe there could be some connection here with someone like Diddy and possibly others that just haven't been caught yet? Um, I don't know if there's any connection. Uh, I'm sure that there's going to be like cross, you know, if Diddy's running a, a, a blackmail sex ring and Epstein was, you're, and they're all dealing with very powerful people, you're probably going to see people that are kind of entangled in both. I'm not sure if there was any cross or if there was any, I don't, I don't think Diddy, for example, was working on behalf of the state of Israel like I think Epstein was. I think Epstein's operation was very specific in that he was an asset for Mossad. And it looks that his handler was Ghislaine Maxwell, whose father was a big member of Mossad. And so that looks like a very specific reason for why that, not just Mossad, it looks like then Epstein was probably used by other organizations who were like, oh, that's clever. Let's, you know, like the CIA. <laughs> Hey, might have been like, oh, let's get in on that too. Like, hey, if you know, if, if he's already set up, like, why not? Why not? Why not utilize this guy? So I do think Epstein was very specific for uh, intelligence services. I don't know if Diddy was. I think Diddy, but it's you know, it what it goes to show is that, um, well, what we know is that in society, you get caught up in sex scandal, then your career could be over. I mean, look at Tiger Woods with the sex scandal that he had to do. You know, that he lost a lot of. It wasn't anything dealing with children or any sort of blackmail operation, but it still cost him quite a bit. We see this with um, Elliot Spritzer, right? There's all these people that get involved. And when the sex stuff comes out, their careers are ruined. So people have, uh, you know, the, a, a, a reason for wanting to hide things and for wanting to keep that kind of stuff secret. That then is obviously very powerful. It's a powerful blackmail tool. And so I think anybody who's looking for power for any way might want to use that tool. And then in particular, if they want to use underage and really get you on something that's illegal, then they really could get you 
And I, so I don't know if there's any cross there between the two, except that there's they are similar in in what they were trying to achieve, which is blackmail using this using sex and using underage people. And it's just a showcasing. There are only there they those two are two of many. You know, there are many other operations like this going on. And for their own gain, their own reason. What Diddy's gain was and his reason for doing it, I think was different than Jeffrey Epstein's. I'm but you mm-hmm. know, I, I of course could be wrong on that. And they could end up having some sort of crossing over in some way. I'm sure there were a lot of the same people involved, but that's because they were all a bunch of perverts, right? Um I think Diddy could be actually one of the lower people on the totem pole, and it's actually someone bigger over him. Oh, you mean like in that particular scandal? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean that one is really weird. That the Diddy stuff, you know, because they're they're accusing him of like killing Tupac, right, or at least uh, putting out the hit on Tupac, mm-hmm. and and apparently his ex girlfriend Cassidy said that he tried to, that he blew up Kid Cudi's car. Yeah, like, this guy is a dangerous dude. I mean, if Diddy is, then I mean he's much sl- well. I think the difference is. It kind of would show with Epstein. Epstein has an entire intelligence organization to cover everything up. You know, what does Diddy got? <laughs> you know, he might have been doing it all for power and fame and and you know the ability to control an industry or keep himself on top of an industry or grow the artists he wanted to grow, you know, all of it for money or something. But in the end, he's gonna come crashing down, just like Weinstein, just like a lot of these guys that were doing it for their own personal gain and their own personal perversions, and not because some intel service was behind them. And I think that's like a huge difference we're seeing between Epstein and like Diddy and Weinstein and all these other, and Cosby, you know, who got themselves caught up in these, in these, um, you know, in, in these types of, I don't even want to, scandal is not even an appropriate word because it's beyond scandal, right? I mean, it's atrocious. It's crazy. It's crazy. All right, Kim, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, Where can people find you? And do you have anything cool uh, coming up? Well, you can find me on my show. It's Monday through Friday, 5 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Eastern at Rum- on Rumble. So it's the Kim Iverson Show on Rumble. And I live stream every day. Um, and cool coming up. Well, I do have um, Helga LaRouche coming on tomorrow's show from the LaRouche. Organ- you know, I'm, I'm speaking to LaRouche herself. So that'll be an interesting conversation about the Oasis plan, about her vision for... I think we need to give more attention to the voices that have plans outside of the current plan that the U.S. military industrial complex has, which is dominate through bullying. And there are people out there with better ideas and better plans of how the U.S. can uh, fit into the world without being a big bully. And so LaRouche is one of those. And so I think it's an important conversation to have. So doing that tomorrow. Interesting. All right, Kim, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Happy Easter. You too. Bye. All right, guys. Awesome time there. Kim always has uh, a lot of information, lots of information. So if you're not following her, make sure you do that because she talks about a lot of stuff and she has really interesting guests. We have three more stories I do want to cover. So first and foremost, let's give a shout out to Savvy Patrons. If you haven't had a chance to do so, go ahead and smash that like button. If you're new, don't forget to like, sub and share. And then we're going to go ahead and dive into the thumbnail comments and we'll keep it moving, guys. It is Easter Sunday. Thank you so much for spending your time with me when you didn't have to. (laughs) All right. Thank you so much for those of you who are savvy patrons. I got my thumbnail here. Yep. Thank you for the savvy uh, patrons. If you're interested in being a savvy patron, I have five categories, ultimate, sabinators, sabsters. Don't forget about those sabbies. And of course, members, all of their names are listed here. And you can also see their names scrolling across the bottom of the screen there on the ticker. Thank you guys so much for your support. Really do appreciate you. Appreciate you. Appreciate you. Yeah. We're going to have interesting guests coming up. uh, Maybe more so this week. I got to double check. I'll check email and let you know. (laughs) Uh, But we are going to have pretty interesting guests coming up on this show. So stay tuned for that. Folks, I will let you know. What else are we talking about today, ladies and gentlemen? Let's go ahead and share that thumbnail. 
Dooby dooby doo. All right. Tonight, we are also discussing, of course, Kim Iverson was just here. We're also going to discuss Candace Owens claps back at Ben Shapiro. It is getting crazy out here in these streets. We're going to get into that story. Candace is finally uh, speaking out more now that Ben Shapiro has been doing like this podcast tour. Uh, we're going to get into that. We're also going to discuss Morning Joe is smearing Palestinians and Palestinian protesters. We'll get into that story. And last but not least, if you haven't heard about this, apparently, according to Lizzo, she has decided to quit the music industry. Really interesting that this is happening right after she uh, performed a little mini show there at that Joe Biden fundraiser. So, um, Interesting. <laughs> Interesting. All right, guys, let's go ahead and get into the comments here. Thank you for the super chat. Troy, love Miss Kim Iverson. Thank you for that. Thank you, Raul. Happy Trans Visibility Day. Thank you, Raul. Trauma Queen says, dynamic duo over here. Kim, love, Sabby, love. Thank you. Thank you, Troy. RFK Jr. still better pick than Biden or Trump, in my opinion. I don't think he's that much different, folks. Thank you, CM. Free Palestine. Thank you, none of your business. Wife, WFE. I'm careful about that word because YouTube's being funny about the, the off yourself word now. WFE, Vice Pick Married 3, Zion, Are We Nuts? Okay. Thank you, Super Seamster. Two finely intelligent women teaching Bakersfield. Thank you. Thank you, Blunts and Otters. That name always cracks me up. Look up faithless electors. The Electoral College has nine of them in 2016 with Dems funding the effort. This is how they'll hand the election to Biden. Hmm. We'll have to see. Thank you, Juanita. Trump just said that to pander to the minority. Yeah, Trump is a... Uh, he knows what to say at the right time. I think he knows how to read the room. Thank you, Ruben. Will Greg Abbott crucify Jesus next session? <laughs> Greg Abbott has lost it. Thank you, Karinka. Sabby RFK won't debate Max because they once had a friendly connection and he feels guilty, in my opinion. That's interesting, too. And thank you, Trauma Queen. We are entering the age of Aquarius. Things done in the dark will come to light. Freedom, rebellion, transformative energy, hidden motives will be revealed. Endings and beginnings will occur. I hear you there, Trauma Queen. I can see those things happening. All right. Let's get into this story from Morning Joe because uh, I pretty much had it with the smears and Morning Joe allowing certain people to come onto the show and say the things that they're saying about Palestinian people, about the protesters, and not offering the alternative voice. They're not letting other people come onto that show and speak their piece. So it really pisses me off, but I want you to pay attention to what they're trying to do now because now. They're trying to make it so that if you are wearing certain, <sighs> certain clothing items, if you are, it's not just about you saying certain phrases anymore. If you are wearing certain clothing items that is technically pro-Palestine, now they are trying to say that that is anti-Semitic. I kid you not, folks, you cannot make this up. Let's get into this piece here. We're talking about far right anti-Semitism. Sad fact is we have it on the far right. We have it on the far left and we have it. And I hear it all the time on college campuses. It has gotten so extreme on, on many college campuses. I've heard firsthand, you can't even talk about a two state solution without being accused of being a Zionist. You can't. Because you are. <laughs> because you are. Because you still want the state of Israel to exist. Because you still want, you know, damn well that Benjamin Netanyahu or whoever would replace him, we have to be clear. We know damn well that they would not allow the Palestinian people to have their own military. So this is important. If you have a two, two states, that means that the Palestinians 
get the right to have a military. This is part of the reason why Netanyahu doesn't want the two-state solution. And then also the two-state solution that they are offering, meaning those in the media, does not give Palestinian people the right to return. And that is crucial. That is very important. Talk about peace between the Palestinians and the Jews without being called a Zionist. Jonathan Shait wrote this uh, for New York Magazine. This week, the president of the main pro-Palestinian student group at the University of Michigan shared and then deleted a social media message saying this. Until my last breath, I will utter death to every single individual who supports the Zionist state. Death and more. Death and worse. The university sent an email denouncing the message. While she may be an undergrad, this student's hardly anonymous. She was one of four undergraduates who received the University of Michigan's Dr. Martin Luther King Spirit Award, honoring students, quote, who best exemplify the leadership and extraordinary vision of the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. I, it's just, it's absolutely bizarre. There's, there's nobody that is, is, is less in line with the message of Dr. Martin Luther King than somebody that would talk about death and more, death and worse. Last month, the New York Times... Uh, Pause. Um, they are actually not representing MLK in the proper way because a lot of people will refer to MLK and say that MLK was a Zionist. That's actually not true. They'll leave out the part where MLK said that he was actually gravely concerned, where MLK was supposed to actually go visit uh, Israel. And then there was the war that broke out during that time. There was conflict that broke out in the Middle East during that time. And that actually didn't happen. So he didn't get to make that speech. But after that, he actually said that he was gravely concerned about Israel's pursuit to take over more of the land and to displace the Palestinian people. And he said that that would be problematic because it would cause people and cause the Palestinian people and people in the world to have a resentment towards Israel. And look what you see is happening now. So you see, they want to leave that part out. This is why I mainstream media drives me crazy because they'll tell you the whitewash version of MLK, but they won't tell you the other things, the more radical things that MLK said. They won't tell you that MLK was a socialist. They won't tell you those things. Jointly profiled her in a pro-Israel activist in a story presenting both as searching for common humanity. As dusk neared, they walked alone to a nearby campus building and sat together on a bench. Maybe this would be the chance to recognize one another's humanity, the Times reported. He needed to know why anti-Israel protesters had not forcefully condemned the deaths of Israeli civilians. And as Jonathan Shade said, I think that mystery has been cleared up. And Donnie, you cannot on college campuses on elite college campuses, it is hard to even bring up what happened on October 7th without being called a Zionist. It is hard for a student to not get canceled if they bring up the horrors of what happened on October 7th. That is misleading. Students are not being, I'm sorry, students that are bringing up <clears throat> the pro-Israel version of October 7th are not being canceled. They're not being canceled by the administration. The students that have been threatened to be canceled are the ones who took the pro-Palestinian side, such as the students that wrote that letter at Harvard University. Those were the ones that people were trying to cancel. So this is just, it's so misleading, it's ridiculous. It's, it's, it is there, there is, and in, in so many of these groups on college campuses, and I've seen it firsthand, I've heard about it firsthand, there's, there's not just a, a, a plea, uh, and I think a, a plea that we would all agree with, to save civilian lives in Gaza. There is an underlying hatred for Israel that's been there for years. I talked about Turning Point. You can also see other documentaries on World War II right now on Netflix that show how Jews have always been treated, the, the hatred for Jews. You see the hatred of Jews. Jonathan and I have been talking about this for years. It's been also, again, misleading. People are not having the hatred towards Jewish people. People are upset and angry towards the Israeli government. But you notice the way that he is framing it, right? He has to frame it that way 
in order to use the excuse that this is anti-Semitic. So that's why he's framing it that way. Joe Scarborough knows better. These people know better. They know exactly what they're doing. You're going to see in just a second, they actually interviewed Jonathan Greenblatt from the ADL. So they brought on this guy from the Anti-Defamation League, which, by the way, I revealed to you a couple of weeks ago that he is actually the one that was behind the TikTok ban. It was Zionists that were pushing the TikTok ban because too much information was getting out about the history of Israel, the creation of Israel, and what the IDF was actually doing to the Palestinian people. So the, the Zionist organizations like the ADL and APAC, and there's other ones as well, they have captured way too much control, not just in this country, in the world. When we talked about the UK as well, the UK doesn't have APAC, but they have their own version of APAC. It's like that in other countries that are part of the West. Rising from the right. It's been rising on college campuses from the left. I was talking about this in Scarborough country in 2003. Just such extremism against Jews on the right, far right, and on the far left. You know, it's so beyond college campuses. Jonathan's group put out a survey that one in four Americans say they know someone that dislikes or hates Jews, and one in four Americans are know somebody who is pro-Hamas. Pro-Hamas. Pause. So this is Jonathan's survey. Jonathan is the guy here on the right, right? So he is the one that is in charge of the Anti-Defamation League, which is also a Zionist uh, organization. So what you need to understand and know is that this survey that he's talking about I'm pretty sure, I'm willing to bet you, the survey did not ask people if they dislike Jewish people. I'm pretty sure that survey probably asked them what their opinion was of Israel. And what they are doing is they're taking that and they're saying, well, this means Jewish people. So for example, it's like if someone gave you a survey and they said, what do you think about people? What do you think about people? And no, what do you think about North Carolina? Right. And let's say you have a negative opinion of the state of North Carolina. Does that mean that you hate all the people that live in North Carolina? Does that mean you hate any of the people that live in North Carolina? No, it doesn't. It's just like if you were to give someone a survey that's overseas and you ask them, what is your opinion of the United States of America? And they have a negative opinion of it. That doesn't mean that they hate Americans. You can dislike the government and not hate the people. So just pay close attention to that. It's coming from the ADL. Jesus, I, I just can't. I can't. This is bad. In four Americans are know somebody who is pro Hamas, pro Hamas. That means you are pro annihilating Israel. You are pro killing Jews. And as Jonathan also pointed out, we're getting squeezed on two levels. We're getting squeezed from the right. We're getting squeezed from the left. To that same point that he said there, that if you're pro Hamas, that means that you are uh, pro, you know, the killing of Jewish people. So you can flip that and say the same thing about Israel, because you can say that if you're pro Israel, that you're pro the killing of Palestinian people. So you see how this can go both ways. The rhetoric to me, it's very problematic. And being like pro Hamas, which you don't even have to be pro Hamas, basically asking for some type of self-determination for the Palestinian people, asking that these people not be occupied and oppressed anymore. They are calling that pro Hamas. That's how far this has gone. This man right here on the right is a certified liar. He's a certified propagandist. And they've been doing this for a long time. And there's also another kind of anti-Semitism where you get squeezed, where on the one hand, people are anti-Semitic against Jews and, and the tropes of vermin and they're not humans. But on the other hand, oh, they have too much. The Jews have too much. So they're getting squeezed from the left and the right and the top and the bottom. And those numbers are staggering and they're frightening. And it just sends chills through me. Yeah, I mean, look, Donnie, I think Joe put his finger on something incredibly important. So Caddy asked before, well, the threat of far right extremists. Here's the thing. When a student who's honored at the University of Michigan is praising and pleading for the death of Jews. Nobody did that. No one did that. 
Do you see the lies? You see the exaggeration? No one has done this. No one has gotten up there and said, oh, we need to get rid of these people. No one has said that. These are lies. And then they wonder, MSNBC and CNN, you wonder why your ratings are in the toilet. You wonder why people don't watch you. I have to watch them, guys. Sorry, so I can correct the shit for you. But you wonder why. This is why people are turning away from mainstream media because these people, they just make things up and they say it as fact. No receipts, no nothing, no nothing. And then they bring on this clown to tell all of these lies. And there's no one else on this panel, on the show to give any type of pushback. And that's another thing. That shows you that they're trying to push just that narrative and not the other one. They're not giving a fair side. They're not letting you hear both sides of the coin here. Why isn't she considered an extremist? So the far right, there's no far, you know, there's no white supremacist club at the University of Michigan that says these things. That, but by the way, the white supremacists say death to the Zionists. So why is it allowed that you have these students it's spewing this vile venom, making death threats against their peers. They have not been making any death threats. This is such a lie. I worked in higher ed for over 10 years, you guys. I'm still in touch with some of my former students before I left Boston University. This is not what is being said. These people are just lying. We should all be clear on this. Everyone on the panel, everyone watching me right now, when the white supremacists say death to the Zionists, everybody says that's wrong. Why is it okay when the radical left says death to the Zionists? We have got to all ask ourselves this. If you are concerned about white supremacy and that sort of extremism, and you should be, as Joe was just saying, you have got to be concerned because these kids on these college campuses, guess where they're going? To your boardrooms. They're going to editorial boards. They're going to the assignment desk of news networks. People who say death to the Zionists, I wish for that and worse. Pause here for a second. So what he is alluding to is that basically this is him putting out a call. He is putting out a call for corporations not to hire the students that are pro-Palestinian. He's not saying it that way. He's not saying those exact words. But that is him, his way of putting out the call, ladies and gentlemen. And look at the panel. This is what I was talking about. Look at the panel, okay? So no one on this panel is Palestinian. No one on the panel is there to represent the Palestinian view. Not one person. And then they got the nerve to have the one black guy here. So what just... Do you see what's happening here? So Israel has lost support. They've lost public support. The majority of Americans, the majority of people polled in the world is against what Israel is doing, regardless of political party. So now they got to bring in this guy. They're trying their best, trying their best. How can we get people to support Israel again? Okay, let's just say that basically these kids that are for the Palestinians, those people are anti-Semitic. I'm going to say it again for the 100th time on this show. Palestinians are Semites too. Semites are those who speak a Semitic language that includes Arabs, that includes Hebrew. So being pro-Palestinian is not being anti-Semitic. More people need to write that down and pass that on. And if you wouldn't tolerate it, if someone is wearing a swastika on their arm, I'm sorry, you shouldn't tolerate it if they're wearing a kaffir on their neck. Yeah. All right. Calling death to anyone. So you guys hear this? All right, CEO. So he fro I think he froze there a little bit. I have another version of that part. Maybe Hotspot got it right. This is the part here where they're talking about clothing. Pay attention to this. You have got to be concerned because these kids on these college campuses, guess where they're going? To your boardrooms. They're going to editorial boards. They're going to the assignment desk of news networks. People who say death to the Zionists, I wish for that and worse. 
And if you wouldn't tolerate it, if someone is wearing a swastika on their arm, I'm sorry, you shouldn't tolerate it if they're wearing a kafia. Kafia. He's saying kafia. I think he got disconnected a little bit. But the kafia is the scarf that you've seen people probably wearing at the Palestinian protests. It's the white scarf with the black, you know, like lines and dots and stuff like that. So now he's trying to compare that to someone wearing a swastika. Do you guys see what's happening? What's going to happen now? First, they started telling people you couldn't say from the river to the sea. They said, no, no, we got to ban those people that do this. Now they're trying to tell you that if you're wearing a kafia, that that is also anti-Semitic. What's next, ladies and gentlemen? What else are they going to tell you? What else is the ADL going to tell you that you cannot wear? You cannot say you cannot do. What are they going to do if they see you wearing black people? I'm going to say this, too, because what happens if they say if you're wearing a Malcolm X hat, if you're wearing a T-shirt with Malcolm X, any of the black re revolutionary leaders, what if they come back and say that that's anti-Semitic because of the views that Malcolm X had, because of the views that Nelson Mandela had, because of the views that Kwame Ture had? What if they start telling you you can't wear clothing that has those revolutionary leaders on it because that is also deemed anti-Semitic? You know how far this can go? What if it gets to the point where they start banning those books? I'm just thinking far in the future. I'm thinking about how far they can really take this. If they tell you from now on, we are no longer selling Malcolm X's autobiography. Look at what is happening around us, folks. They're trying to take away your, your speech. They're trying to tell you what you can and cannot say. Now he's trying to tell you what you can and cannot wear. What else is next? What are we going to do? Next thing you know, it's going to be if you don't pledge some type of alliance to Israel, you're going to be deemed as a traitor in this country. Think back to McCarthyism. Think back to how they, they were going around calling people just randomly. You know, communists, let's jail these people. They're a communist. What do you think is coming? And it's hard to think about that now because of the way that we live. But they're already, they already had FBI agents go to this woman's house, this Muslim woman's house, because of pro-Palestinian posts that she put on Facebook. This is a problem. Then they're trying to take away TikTok. Let's get rid of that. There's too much, too much truth being told on there about the state of Israel. If they can't control the narrative, they will try to remove that platform. This is insane. I have never in my life heard someone say that a kafia is similar to a swastika. You've got to be kidding me. You've got to be kidding me. What's up next, guys? What's next? All of you that have moved to the United States from another country, what if they tell you you can't have your Puerto Rican flag in your car anymore? Take it down. That's not pro-Israel. In 2024, we have moved backwards. We should be moving forward. We should have more freedom of speech. We should have more freedom of expression, but we're going backwards. These are very scary times. Some of you watching, you may have lived through the McCarthy era. I didn't, I read about it. I've heard about it. I don't want to go to that, but we need to start talking about the immense amount of power that groups like the ADL and APAC have in this country where they can make these, these determinations, these decisions. Now that's him putting out another call. So he put out a call here on national television telling people that if someone is wearing a kafia, that's the same thing as someone wearing a swastika. And none of these things that they are saying or that they are doing is making things easier for Jewish people. I can tell you that much. You're not helping Jewish people. You're making things worse for them. You're making things harder for them. 
And I know many Jewish people that will tell you that this clown right here, Jonathan Greenblatt, does not represent them. Such a mess. Such a mess. Miko Paled actually responded to this. Miko's been on the show as well. He said, Green Blot and the ADL are lying, despicable, hate mongering, terror supporting, genocide sympathizers. The ADL must be shut down. And don't forget, wear your kafiya with pride. Like the flag of Palestine, it is a symbol of hope and freedom. Well said, Miko. Well said. These are crazy times, folks. Thank you for the super chat, Saka, or Saker, Saker, Saker. Many U.S. Special Forces operators wear the kafiya also. They're anti Semites also, then, per Scumborough's logic. Mm hmm. Thank you, Super Seamster. RBN may be the coldest channel online, Bakersfield. Bakersfield, California, I'm assuming. Shout out to Hardlands Media in the chat. Happy Easter, Kit. Hope you're having a good day. Thank you, Yantra, for the super sticker. And thank you, CM. Not my Puerto Rican flag. This is what I'm saying. Like, what's next? It's a mess. Don't be surprised if one day they try to make it so that the only flags that you can fly in this country is the American flag and the flag representing the state of Israel. All right. If you haven't had a chance to do so, go ahead and smash that like button, guys. If you're new, don't forget to like, sub, and share. All right, we're moving on to something a little bit more lighthearted. Kind of interesting, but lighthearted. So apparently, it's, it's really interesting that... You know, Joe Biden, Bill Clinton, and Barack Obama actually just had this huge fundraiser in New York City at Radio City Music Hall. And apparently they raised millions of dollars, I think over $20 million for Joe Biden's campaign. Joe Biden's doing so poorly, he had to bring in two other warmongers to help him out. But one of the artists that actually was performing at that event was Lizzo. And I bring this up because in a shocking turn of events, it appears that after that event, Lizzo has decided to announce that she is quitting music. So Joe Biden, I don't know what you did, but it says here, this is actually DNC chair, Jamie Harrison. And he posted here, Lizzo rocking the house. We're not gonna play the music, but this was her here at the Joe Biden fundraiser. It wasn't just her. He also had Queen Latifah was also present at this event. So it looked like she was having a good time, right? Okay. At least that's what it looked like there. But apparently over the weekend, something happened. Something happened. And Lizzo made an announcement that she has decided to quit. Let's go ahead and get into this scoop here. It's time for the scoop. Singer Lizzo took to Instagram to declare, quote, I quit following online criticism. And that's not all. Remember Gypsy Rose Blanchard? Well, she announced she is separating from her husband. That's right. It's, it is time now for some of the biggest stories in entertainment. Let's bring in our News Nation entertainment expert to break down the best headlines. Paula Frolic is here with the scoop. Caitlin Becker joining us as well. Great to see you, ladies. Let's start with Lizzo. She said yep. she's quitting in an Instagram post. Well, you know, she's had an interesting week. And yeah. I wrote basically that the DNC had hired her for their big three presidents event. And they said, you know, it's kind of a weird little look. We talked about yeah, it last week. Definitely. I said, it's a weird look. You know, she's being sued for sexual harassment and discrimination. Pause. So there's the piece that I think some people may not have been aware of, or maybe they may have forgotten. Don't forget, she's already facing a lawsuit for sexual harassment. So of course, Joe Biden would invite someone... <laughs> Jesus Christ. Joe Biden himself, who also is accused, actually is accused of sexual assault by Tara Reid. Of course, he would invite someone who is actually facing a sexual harassment lawsuit right now. That's who he invited and they paid her, right? Not the best choice. 
And I don't think that was a good choice for her, but let's get finish this here. Termination. And she's performing for a guy who used to be known as the horn dog in chief. It's a, it's a weird look. And then the women who are suing her, their lawyer called me and said it was shameful that the DMC would hire her and that they're going to regret it and that history was, t you know, history was holding receipts and everyone's going to be just ashamed that they took a part of this. And then a day later, she goes, I quit. And she basically yeah. said she's being bullied. And my issue that I have with that, and you see this quite a lot in Hollywood, is mm -hmm. that people who bully others then when they themselves they can't take the heat so they get out of the kitchen but then they leave and say well i was bullied so it's really gaslighting the women who are suing her and also note she has paid off 14 other women for other claims am i crazy so, i feel like lizzo quit before yeah so it's kind of like a selena gomez thing she comes and goes on social well, media selena gomez, like does it for her mental health but i right. feel like this is not the first time that lizzo has been like this is too much for me i quit and then takes a little break and comes back so right i'm sure we'll see lizzo again i, I think we'll see her again what do you yeah. think paula i hope so i mean i like her music it's just like man i i don't know learn how to behave better be nicer yeah. to people nice come to people. on oh yeah uh lizzo can use some work in that department let me get into what she said, because this is interesting. Lizzo says she quits after lies against her. Again, this was just one day ago. I'll make this larger for the people in the back. In a post on Instagram, the U.S. pop star wrote, I'm starting to feel like the world doesn't want me in it. She did not clarify if this meant she was leaving the music industry or social media. I'm getting tired of putting up with being dragged by everyone in my life and on the internet. Her post comes a day after a lawyer representing her former dancers criticized the decision to choose the pop star to headline a fundraising event amid accusations made against her last year. The dancers allegations included sexual harassment and creating a hostile work environment, which Lizzo has denied. All I want is to make music and make people happy and help the world be a little better than how I found it. But I'm starting to feel like the world doesn't want me in it. She wrote on her social media posts, the good as hell singer 35 said she was constantly up against lies, which she said were being told about her for clout and views. She added she felt she was the butt of the joke every single time because of how she looks and that her character was being picked apart by people who don't know her. I didn't sign up for this, she concluded. I quit. Mm, but you did sign up for it. When you become a celebrity, when you choose to enter the entertainment business, when you choose to become famous, you do sign up for that. You sign up for all of it. You know, things were different 20 years ago before social media was around. But it's even more difficult now that there's social media because it used to be that celebrities would hear things about their self rather on Entertainment Tonight or All Access or in the tabloids. But now because of social media, they hear the criticism, you know, right on their phone, whether it's Facebook or, or Twitter, et cetera. But you do sign up for that, right? It goes on to say stars were quick to show support for Lizzo, commenting on her posts. Reality TV star and entrepreneur Paris Hilton wrote, we love you, queen. Destiny Child singer Latoya Luckett added, you are deeply loved. It's funny, they still call Latoya Luckett Destiny's Child singer because Latoya Luckett hasn't performed or sang with Destiny Child in years. Um, they should say former. Destiny's Child uh, singer, Lizzo was known for celebrating her body and self-love, but has also spoken out in the past about hurtful online comments about her looks. In May last year, she said she had received a new wave of body shaming comments on X, formerly Twitter, that included speculation about her diet and whether she eats a lot of fast food. Y'all don't know how close I be to giving up on everyone and quitting, she wrote at the time. Last August, three of her former dancers sued Lizzo over claims of sexual harassment and creating a hostile work environment. And so we're going to get into that discussion as well, because this is all connected. Armchair Kami actually mentioned here asking someone credibly accused of sexual harassment to headline your fundraiser is so on brand for Joe Biden. Yeah.
Exactly. So, and I argued this back then, you know, when this event was announced, even if you were asked, like, I think Lizzo should have just said no, considering the fact that she does have that investigation going on right now. But also, like, as a musician, I don't think you should tie yourself to any politician. We remember when this happened. Remember when Diddy was out there saying vote and uh, probably not the best example to use nowadays. Kid Rock tied himself to Donald Trump, right? I don't think as a musician, as an artist, I don't think you should tie yourself to a politician because whatever that politician does, when they mess up, everybody's going to be looking at you like, oh, didn't you perform with this person or whatever? So I don't think she should have accepted that. But I also don't think Joe Biden's Biden's administration should have reached out to her. But why did they? They reached out to Lizzo because they know that that's someone that is really beloved among a lot of younger people, right? And he's losing, or not really losing, but he's decreased with young voters in this country, right? We can see that from the polls. He's decreased with young voters, black voters, Latino voters. So that's why you would go get someone like Lizzo, who is popular and trendy with the young kids. You could have gotten someone else though. But I want to show you what her dancers were actually claiming at that point in time, because this is still ongoing. Well, just moments ago, Lizzo broke her silence on the lawsuit filed against her by three of her former dancers who claim they were subjected to a hostile work environment and harassment. The complaint also naming her production company and the captain of her dance team. And it says that the dancers were, quote, exposed to an overtly sexual atmosphere that permeated their workplace, which included outings where nudity and sexuality were a focal point. The suit also alleges, among other things, that Lizzo called out one of the plaintiffs for her weight gain after accusing the dancer of not being committed to her role. Lizzo is known, of course, for her uplifting messages and advocacy for body positivity. I'm not going to be able to please everybody with my outward appearance. Someone's always going to have a critique. Someone's always going to have some negativity to say about me. So it, all that matters is what I think about it. Now, after what had been a notably lengthy silence this morning, Lizzo responded to the lawsuit on Instagram, writing, in part, these sensationalized stories are coming from former employees who have already publicly admitted that they were told their behavior on tour was inappropriate and unprofessional. I take my music and my performances seriously because at the end of the day, I only want to put out the best art that, uh, that represents me and my fans. With passion comes hard work and high standards. Joining us now are the three dancers, Crystal Williams, Ariana Davis, and Noel Rodriguez, along with their attorney, uh, Ron Zambrano. Uh, Crystal, I want to start with you. The, the response that you have to uh, the response from Lizzo after the silence for a pretty extended period of time. Uh, yeah, I want to say that um, reading it uh, just kind of further my, furthered my like disappointment uh, in regards to the situation just because the facts are the facts. What we experienced and what we witnessed is absolutely what, what happened. There's nothing sensationalized um, about it. So all that I can hope is that people focus more so on the facts rather than the court of public opinion. Mariana, at what point did you realize that what you were experiencing, what you led you experienced was not normal? Um, I it's hard to answer that question because as this was my first professional job i was told by the dance captain and you know um just it's this thing in the dance industry that you have to you know shut up and you know take whatever you get and just be grateful for whatever for whatever you get uh mike i want to ask you about this question you said lizzo burned so many bridges here in mpls what do you mean by that uh, Eric, if you see uh, Mike HW's response to this come through, can you star that uh, comment? I'm just curious uh, what he means by that, that you take whatever is given to you. I, I do have friends that have been uh, dancers that have been a part of the entertainment industry, and they said it's very hard to get those dancing positions. They're also not paid much. You know, sometimes you see you go to a concert and you see like Beyonce's backup dancers or whoever you're going to see at that point in time. And you think that just because they're on the stage with someone who's like a billionaire that they're making pretty good money, but those dancers are paid crap. They don't make as much as you would think they do. And it's a short lived career. I mean, like they want you to be young. And once you get to be a certain age, then they're just kind of like, no, um, MPLS equals all oh, Minneapolis, Minnesota. 
Okay. Interesting. She burned bridges there? Interesting. I'll let her finish though. Sorry. For crumbs you get um, as a dancer. Um, so a lot of things that were going on, it took me a really long time to figure out that it was wrong. It took me actually until leaving the, the camp that I figured out that everything that w went on was bad because I just chalked it up to, you know, oh, Liz, it might be a diva or, you know, this is just the industry. This is what we we go through. I mean, I I I think that I had inklings like I would be on the phone with my mom all day and, and be like just complaining about the, the disrespect and the, the treatment and the, the humiliation. I mean, m me personally, looking at um, the response from Lizzo was so disheartening because she was there. She was there. And to fix your hand to write on a piece of paper that you don't, that you discredit everything we're saying is incredibly frustrating. Um, the facts are the facts, like Crystal said. Was I pressured to touch a new performer? Yes. Was I brought into a private meeting where I was kind of interrogated about my personal matters and ended up having to share very personal, personal things about myself regarding my weight? Yes. What, I mean, it, the list goes on. Were we pressured to do an excruciatingly long rehearsal that turned into a re-audition for the job that we already booked? because apparently we weren't doing good enough yes so she's saying yes but she mentioned something about her weight uh sheree said all dancers i think i mean dancers have to keep a certain weight even beyonce has rules yeah it's interesting uh some of the things that she's saying i kind of feel like that is part of the industry um, even the part where she said it felt like they were re-auditioning i've heard about that happening before so i i don't know Yes, that is true. During that, during that um, excruciatingly long re-audition process, was I under the impression that if I left the stage, I would be fired? Yes. Did I, unfortunately, go to the bathroom on myself on one stage because I was so terrified? Yes. There okay, that part's not the norm. Sorry. <laughs> that part right there, people using the bathroom. I never heard about that. Never heard about that. There's, you in a court of law, I don't know. I'm not a lawyer. I don't know anything, but I know that if you ask someone to tell the truth, these things will come out of her mouth. If right. you have to say yes or no to these questions, she has to say yes, because they are true. There was multiple witnesses and I, I don't appreciate, um, the discredit of, of our feelings and our experiences and our traumas. Okay. So those are some of the dancers that actually, uh, filed that lawsuit against Lizzo. Really interesting, man. Like, I don't think they're protected in the entertainment industry. Um, maybe they need to unionize. I don't think they have one. The Oracle brought up a really good point here, but why is that wearing very revealing clothing construed to be a celebration of oneself? You can have a great self-concept as a big person and be fully dressed. That is true. I guess it's just, I guess Lizzo kind of feels like, you know, she feels that she can wear those things as well. Um, but yeah, I, I see your point. Uh, Mike HW said, have lots of friends that are musicians here in MPLS. So many stories of Lizzo backstabbing, clawing her way to the top, treating people like shit. Yeah. That is not uncommon. I hear you there. Uh, Tim says, well, the DNC is all a bunch of old people who are behind the times and probably still think she's some sort of progressive figure. That's a good point. Oh man, you guys are rolling in tonight. Uh, Lee says, Savvy Sabs, you've been a courageous and tremendous voice in your commitment to truth and historical facts. Keep up the good work. Thank you, Lee. And shout out to Lee for being a member for seven months. Uh, thank you, Leprechaun. This is a manipul manipulative technique with malignant narcissists where they poke and the poke and the poke, oh, you mean they, and they poke and they poke at their target until their target snaps and then cries abuse. Interesting.
Uh, thank you for this super chat, Lee. Wow, thank you a lot. Sabby Sabs, you've been a courageous and tremendous voice in your commitment to truth and historical facts. Keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank you, Sparky. Love you, Sabby. Happy Easter. You're the bestest girl ever. Thank you. Uh, Zed says, you rock, Sabby. Wow, I love your news. Truth, good on you. Thank you. You guys are being really nice and friendly today. Usually people are got sad people cussing me out a couple times. Uh, thank you, Snort. Come on. At least Obama did not ask her to go swim. Interesting. Interesting. Well, it's just, I'll get the comment on Rockfin in just a second, uh, Eric, but this is a doozy, you know. I really liked Lizzo's songs. I thought they were kind of fun, you know. And she was like, What's the song about the men? Um, why men great? Cause they gotta be great, or when they wanna be great, something like that. I actually I thought those songs were kind of fun, but uh seems like Lizzo needs to take a break. And sometimes those things need to happen. Let me get that comment on uh Rockfin, Daniel. Thank you, Daniel, for the tip on Rockfin. I have difficulty patronizing anybody who supports RFK because as far as I'm concerned, RFK is a staunch supporter of a Jewish supremacist, supremacist state. Would they support someone who is a supporter of a white supremacist if the white supremacist was good on everything else and the other person is just as bad? That's a good point, Daniel. <laughs> That's a really good point. Thank you for this as well. Um, but Salem is a Jewish led Israeli human rights group on their website. There is a position paper and the heading of it is very instructive. The first two lines are a regime of Jewish supremacy from the Jordan river to the Mediterranean sea underneath that in bigger letters, it says, this is apartheid. Here is the link. Thank you so much for that. Eric, you want to copy and paste that link into the chat. Thanks. Based. All right, now we're going to get to our final story today, which is Candace Owens claps back at Ben Shapiro. So Ben Shapiro, he has been on Pierce Morgan recently and also Dave Rubin. We talked about the Pierce Morgan interview uh, Friday, I believe. Now we are going to discuss uh, the comments that he made in the Dave Rubin interview. And it is very obvious now that Ben is kind of making the rounds. <laughs> And Candace has yet to have an interview to speak about her side of the situation of her being removed from the Daily Wire. Uh, but Ben has been making the rounds. You know, he kind of got out there first. This is one of those times where I will say that, like, whenever you have this type of situation happen, you know, sometimes it's good to be to be the first one to get out there and make sure that your voice is heard, particularly if you are the one that was was fired, the one that was removed. But time has gone by and you'll understand why uh, Candace has not done that. You'll understand why she has chosen not to do that. Uh, and apparently Ben was supposed to not do that as well. But he is. And here we are. It just goes to show you once again, you can't trust people. So let's go ahead and get into this conversation that he had with Dave Rubin. Uh, because think, you know, for someone who says they don't want to talk about it, as he told Pierce Morgan, I'm not going to talk about it. We're not going to talk about that. He is talking about it. Listen to what he said to Dave Rubin. I think in the beginning here, they're discussing uh, people getting Ben Shapiro wrong. <laughs> Listen to this. I think I've hit the, the bottom of the pessimistic well. It turns out that there are leagues below me. Yeah. And I can always find new ways to be pessimistic. All right. So let's, uh, let's do a bunch of stuff here. We've obviously, we've done this over Skype and that kind of stuff a couple of times, even just in the last few months, but it's been a while since we've sat down. I actually have notes here, which I hate having, but I want to kind of cover everything. I, in some ways I want to do this as if I had never seen you before or know some of your stuff or interviewed you before. Cause I think there's a lot of confusion about you and your positions, which is, do you find that odd? Like someone who speaks as precisely and fast as you do that people seem to be confused over your positions? Yes. And, and I find it deeply confusing because, again, I'm public record on everything for at least 20 years. I, I started writing a syndicated column when I was 17. I'm currently 40. So the, the notion that you have to go far to search for my opinions is strange to me. But the online world is not a real world. And the phrase I've been finding myself using a lot lately is touch some grass. Mm -hmm. And people need to go outside and they need to touch some grass. Like turn off X, go touch some grass. Turn off. <laughs> 
it's kind of funny the way that he says it. Touch some grass. <laughs> this is kind of funny. <laughs> People need to go outside and they need to touch some grass. <laughs> Turn off Instagram, go outside, look at the sky. Like uh, uh, the, the reality is that if you want to know my positions, I've been outspoken about literally all of them. I've not been unclear about them. There are, of course, people who are going to seek to twist those positions into something that they are not. And I understand that's the nature of the game. Nothing, nothing has changed there. But the prevalence and speed with which that happens, that has changed. Uh, and that's gotten significantly worse over the course of the last few years. How do you balance that for yourself? Because I talk about it on the show all the time. I mean, we're in this digital world. We're basically existing in the matrix, which I would say if you spend more than 12 hours and one second on there, you pretty much are just the battery for the thing. Uh, versus we all go out and about, and at least here in Florida, we have a functional society and we we have law and order and things like that. So just contrasting the lunacy that's happening there versus actually, not that everything's great in America, it certainly isn't, we're going to get to it, but there's a huge chasm between those two. For sure. And I you guys have problems in Florida, too. Don't get on here, Dave, and make it seem like Florida is a perfect state. Florida has its own problems, too. There's no such thing as a perfect state. <laughs> All these states have their issues. <laughs> I think that, for me, the big move that I made in my life was probably five, six years ago now, where my wife turned to me and she said, Twitter, even then, was taking up too much of your time and eating your life. You really need to not have Twitter on your phone. And so I took Twitter off my phone. So what I'll do is I'll check in on specific accounts from the outside of Twitter where I actually have to spend the effort to log into yep. uh, to Twitter and, and look up what a specific news account is saying as opposed to just having the scrolling doom feed that, that is also filled with, with an echo chamber about you. The mm -hmm. notifications button on Twitter is bad. It's gotten way worse since the... Listen, I love that Elon took over the, X. You check the Ben Shapiro notifications? No, no, no. I gave that up a long time oh. ago. I, I, okay. I will say that it did get significantly worse when I would check on it since the changes to the blue check. Yeah, uh, I mean, the, the, the changes to the blue check mark definitely opened up all the floodgates in terms of anyone now being in your notifications. So it made it a lot less usable just in terms of being user-friendly and, and people you actually cared about commenting on what you were doing. Um, but with all that said, yeah, I really don't check Twitter a lot except for the news when I'm attempting to prep for the show. And I really try never to check the notifications or the comments or anything remotely like that because it is toxicity all the way up, all the way down. All right, so let's do the elephant in the room for just a Speaking of uh, being toxic, a uh, Twitter being toxic, right? Uh, and notice again, notice how everyone still calls it. We all still call it Twitter, even though Elon, you know, has changed the name to X. I don't think many people are calling it that, but we all still call it Twitter. But speaking of being toxic, I mean, like he's a part of that toxic. <laughs> He's toxic too on Twitter. It's funny the way he talks about it as if it's everybody else and it's not him. But Ben Shapiro is also toxic on Twitter. Let's get to the elephant in the room. The moment because I saw you this week on Piers Morgan. He asked you repeatedly about Candace. Uh, you repeatedly basically said, I you, won't you, talk about you don't that. Want yeah, to talk I'll say about that here too. I, I, yeah, <laughs> and that's fine. And, and, you know, it's interesting because we all sort of came up together to different extents and we've all done a million things together in public events and networks and all of those things. It seems to me that at this moment, she's now a free agent. She happened to end up on Locals, where which I created, and we they were a platform, not a publisher that you guys are. Pause. It's interesting. He refers, it's kind of funny. He calls her a free agent as if she's an athlete. This is kind of funny. Like I'm used to hearing people on like first take, right. Or undisputed refer to athletes as, oh, so-and-so was a free agent. Right. So this is kind of funny to hear him say it that way. Pay attention to this phrase that they're using called, uh, publisher versus platform. Pay close attention to that. Uh, ben Shapiro actually said that in the Pierce Morgan uh, interview. Notice Dave Rubin is saying it here again, and you're going to hear Ben say it again as well. And I'm going to explain to you why that actually uh, makes a difference and why I think they're repeating that rhetoric. Let me take it back just for a second. So listen to this part right here. Uh, you repeatedly basically said, I won't talk about don't that. Want yeah, to talk I'll about say that it. here too. I, I, yeah. <laughs> and that's fine. And, and you know, it's interesting because we all sort of came up together to different extents and we've all done a million things together in public events and networks and all of those things. It seems to me that at this moment, she's now a free agent. She happened to end up on Locals, where which I created, and we they were a platform, not a publisher that you guys are. Locals is a platform, not a publisher that you guys are. So he again is stressing that the Daily Wire is a publisher not a platform. We'll get into why that actually matters in just a second. Can you at least talk to just sort of 
just sort of where it's at now. She's not with you. She's free. She's free to do whatever she wants to do, to be wherever she wants to be. And the difference between a publisher like The Daily Wire and a platform like Locals is obviously that a platform should have a very broad range of speech that it allows, including speech that maybe even the creators don't believe is inside what they would consider to be the Overton window. That's a v- Pause, because see, he likes to talk fast. Notice what he's doing again here, guys. You guys see what he's doing? Once again, they are reiterating that it is a publisher. Okay? Are. Can you at least talk to just sort of just sort of where it's at now. She's not with you. She's free. She's free to do whatever she wants to do, to be wherever she wants to be. And the difference between a publisher like The Daily Wire and a platform like Locals is obviously that a platform should have a very broad range of speech that it allows, including speech that maybe even the creators don't believe is inside what they would consider to be the Overton window. That's a very different thing than direct subsidization of particular opinions. Uh, The Daily Wire would not have a host, would not pay a host, who was staunchly pro-abortion. Mm-hmm. They'd have no obligation to be a host who is staunchly pro-abortion. Pause. Let me pull up something here for just a second. All right. It was actually one of you that sent this information to me, and I was not aware of this. So thank you so much. I'm not going to say their name because I don't know if they want their name uh, mentioned, but thank you so much. So listen to this. There is a difference. So apparently a publisher can be sued for content that it publishes, whereas a platform cannot be sued for what's posted on it. So why does that matter in reference to Candace Owens being fired at the Daily Wire? Since Ben and Dave keep telling you that the Daily Wire is a publisher, and remember Ben said a publisher does not have to pay you, right? This is their way of talking out of the legal, any type of legality that they could possibly deal with in the future, right? So if they are a publisher and a publisher cannot be sued for the content that it publishes technically, then that means, or excuse me, can be sued for the content that it publishes, then that means that the content that is published by Candace, which they deem to be anti-Semitic, at some point down the road, arguably, there could be some type of lawsuit against the Daily Wire for the rhetoric that Candace had. I don't know if you believe her rhetoric was anti-Semitic. Based on what I've heard so far and what I've played on the show, I didn't feel was anti-Semitic, right? But they've been, they're throwing this term around to everybody now, right? If you're not overly pro-Israel. So it almost kind of sounds like to me that there has been some type of warning that was given to the Daily Wire, maybe by a donor outside of the Daily Wire, or maybe a pro-Israel group outside of the Daily Wire that maybe sent a warning to the owners of the Daily Wire that if you continue to have her say this rhetoric, we will either pull our money or you could be sued for the content that you are publishing. Whereas with the platform, it says a platform cannot be sued for what's posted on it. Pay attention to that. That's why I think they continue to say that phrase over and over again. Let's go back in. And so when it comes to the host on The Daily Wire, obviously everyone is able to say what they want. Nobody ever comes to me and says, you can't say X. Nobody ever says that to Walsh. No one ever said that to Candace. But the reality is that there is an Overton window at the Daily Wire. Obviously, there was a non-meeting of the minds. That's pretty much all I can say on this. Uh, and, you know, a, a lot of this has happened publicly. Uh, and the, but you know, to the extent that, that the Daily Wire is, in fact, not a publisher, it is a pla- that, that is, in fact, not a platform, it is a publisher. That- see, you see how he keeps saying that? Let me tell you something, guys. You know these people were coached, right? So people like Ben Shapiro, Candace Owens, I mean, Ben, I don't, I don't know if he still gets coaching now. He probably doesn't anymore, but he could have been coached before this interview. So Ben Shapiro, Candace, Owens, like these people were coached. These people had mentors. A lot of us that you see in independent media, especially those of us left independent media, we didn't have a mentor. We didn't have no coach. I didn't have no mentor. I didn't have no coach. <laughs> I just hooked up my webcam and said, here we go. <laughs> Let's, just see. Let's see what happens, right? So we kind of learn along the way and we stumble, we fall, we get back up. 
right? And we just keep doing what we're doing, but we had to kind of just learn along the way. But you have to understand like a publisher, like the Daily Wire, they have a lot of money. So these people, they have money to have people come in and coach them and things like, how do you guys think that like Candace Owens and all the other people that are part of the Daily Wire, you think they just, they were like that right out the gate? No, they were coached. So Ben could have even been coached before this interview. Don't know for sure, but just notice how he keeps saying it's a publisher. That is his way of letting you know that the Daily Wire can't be held accountable for firing Candace Owens because they're not a platform. Let's continue. That means that there is no moral obligation for the Daily, and there's no free speech problem with the Daily Wire saying we don't wish to pay a particular host or that host saying I don't wish to work here anymore because again, there's a parting of the ways that I'm, that, you know, is not really open for discussion at this point. Do, uh, does it surprise you that so many people, even on our side of this, are confused about that as it relates to free speech and quote unquote cancel culture? Like severing a business tie, as long as you're not throwing someone in jail, they're able to be everywhere else is not, I, I'm not super surprised at the controversy, yeah. honestly, because to, to a certain extent, I think that there's been a, a reaction on the right to the excesses of the left. So because what the left did is they said that the Overton window ought to be closed so tight that no one can get inside the Overton window. Basically, if you're to the right of Hillary Clinton, you can't be allowed inside Welcome the Overton to my window. World, yes, exactly. <laughs> and, and not just with regard to platforms, but with regard to publishers. So, for example, this week, NBC News deciding that Ronna McDaniel was too much for them. Ronna right. McDaniel can't work at NBC. See, once again, he's comparing, he's making the comparison between a platform and a publisher. T News, the sacred halls of NBC News must not be sullied by the former head of the RNC. Jen Psaki, however, can have a show on MSNBC, despite being the press secretary for the White House five seconds ago. Right? The, the, the right's response to that is, I think, correct to say you guys have shut the Overton window too tight. But I think some elements of the right have basically said there is no Overton window. The Overton window should be completely exploded with regard not just to platforms, with which I kind of agree, but with regard to publishers. So NBC News not only has an obligation to hire Rana McDaniel, NBC News has the obligation to hire Alex Jones, for example. Right, I, which, I don't which think just that's makes true. no sense at a business level beyond beyond free speech. I mean, there's a reason that networks exist. It, it right, they have, editor they have editorial yeah. positions. Yeah. Daily Wire has a very strong editorial position on a wide variety of, of issues. And by the way, I should say that, you know, there are a lot of people who are suggesting this is about disagreements over Israel. I mean... Pause. So do you see him put his foot in his mouth a little bit here? Watch. So again, because they are a publisher, the Daily Wire has editorial rights. So there are things they can choose to keep. There are things they can choose not to keep. So if the Daily Wire does have that editorial position, that means they can also decide what content they want to be published. So when Ben Shapiro tells you, well, we never told anybody what they could or could not say, maybe not. But if you have that editorial position, you can still tell them what they can or cannot say because you control the content. If you are a publisher, you decide what you want to publish and what you don't want to publish. So you don't have to physically go to Candace and say, you're not allowed to talk about this anymore. But if you're the one that decides whether or not the information is going to be published, in a way, you're still doing some type of censorship. So listen to this part. Alex Jones, for example. Right. Which, I, I which just makes true. no sense at a business level beyond beyond free speech. I mean, there's a reason that networks exist. It, it right. They have, editor they have editorial yeah. positions. Yeah. Daily Wire has a very strong editorial position on a wide variety of, of issues. And by the way, I should say that, you know, there are a lot of people who are suggesting this is about disagreements over Israel. I mean, I can safely say it is not about disagreements over Israel to the extent that without reference to Candace at all here, Matt Walsh has taken the position that America ought not be involved in the Middle East at all. Matt Walsh's position, so far as I understand it, and I've talked to him about it, is that Israel, in a conflict between Israel and Hamas, Israel is obviously a more moral party than the genocidal terrorist group Hamas, but also it's very far away. He doesn't care and it doesn't involve America. That's just a pure isolationist position. I disagree with it. I think it's wrong. I think that, that it's short-sighted, but... But what Matt Walsh has said and what Candace Owens have said are two different things. So it, Matt Walsh is still pro-Israel. It's not the same. And you know, Ben probably shouldn't have done this interview. And I'm going to show you why in just a second, because he just told you this has nothing to do with Israel, right? Okay, I'm going to prove to you that's wrong. Let me let him finish. Again, he's on our platform. That, that is well within the range of acceptable discourse at the Daily Wire. 
So you know, the, the notion that you have to mirror my exact perspectives on, on what Israel is doing in Gaza is obviously not true based on the roster of hosts that we, that we currently have. There are a lot of other factors, obviously, at play. Okay, so let's see if Ben is telling the truth, right? Because, you know, I did a little bit of digging here. Let's, let's go in. We're going to talk about the lack of self awareness. This is really interesting. Someone pulled up of this clip here of Ben Shapiro and it's from at legendary energy says the lack of self-awareness in this statement is incredible. Listen to what Ben said here. I want to talk about the rise of conspiracy theories on all sides. I talked about this a little bit yesterday, but I want to talk about this more at length because the conspiratorial victimhood cult now infuses pretty much every side of the political out. I wish it were restricted to the far progressive left. It is not. It has now pervaded pretty much every area of American political life. Every politician declares that you, everyone, is a member of a victim group. Victimhood politics all the way down. The only question is, who is the conspiratorial force and who is the victim? But everyone is under the bizarre belief that they are being victimized in the freest society in human history. Now I'm going to talk about the rise of conspiracy theories and also. So there's Ben Shapiro talking about himself (laughs) because Ben Shapiro's out here claiming he's the ultimate victim. So Candace apparently has decided to respond. Now, she hasn't uh, said anything to him, uh, I think, since this all happened. But now she's speaking out because Glenn Greenwald also talked about the same interview that I just played that clip there. Glenn Greenwald had some things to say as well. And Candace actually retweeted this and said, Ben, we agreed not to talk about this, but you are very much going on a public tour right now, pretending not to talk about it while you are very much talking about it. Would you like me to do the same? So apparently at some point or another, I guess Candace and Ben had some type of agreement behind the scenes that they were not going to talk about this publicly. But now you see Ben Shapiro on another show talking about this, saying, I'm not going to talk about it. I don't want to talk about it, but I'm talking about it, you know? So apparently Ben decided to break his promise. Imagine that. Imagine that. But there are things that happen behind the scenes. And so censored men actually put this out. Candace Owens Daily Wire email leak. So here we go. This was the email sent to employees at the Daily Wire informing them of the impromptu town hall Jeremy Boeing CEO had organized. So Jeremy Boring, excuse me, employees were told not to bring cell phones to the meeting and that independent contractors would not be allowed to attend. Uh huh. Ha, ha. <laughs> the contractors couldn't come there. Interesting. At the town hall, Daily Wire leadership 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 <laughs> leadership attempted to smear Owens as an anti-Semite in front of their employees to justify her firing. Black bars hide personal details and company positions to prevent doxing. So they covered up that information and you'll see it here forward town hall today at 4 p.m. CST. Please note that this is a private employee only town hall. So please do not bring independent contractors along to the meeting. Also, please leave all cell phones at your desk. No phones will be permitted at the town hall. That was probably to prevent someone from recording what was uh, being discussed in that meeting. Interesting. And then you can see uh, the email was sent March 19th. That was Tuesday, 2024 at 104 p.m. Town hall today at 4 p.m. So that's one of those emergency meetings. I've had those sent to me when I... I was working at uh, some of the academic institutions as well. That's when you know that's not a good thing. And it goes on to say here, please join us for a mandatory town hall at 4 p.m. CST today at 990. Please make your way over in a timely manner and be sure to be seated by 345 p.m. So, yeah, and they're actually retweeting the other one that they showed last week. Now, Candace retweeted this and responded and said, I was not aware of this. Maybe me and Joe Rogan should get together and talk about it while pretending we're not talking about it. So you see what's happening here. So 
If Candace Owens is telling you that she was not aware of that email, that means that the Daily Wire left her off of the email invite. So they sent it to all of the employees except for her. So she is now saying, and she tagged Joe Rogan in this tweet and saying, maybe me and Joe Rogan should get together and talk about it while pretending not talking about it. Right? So if Joe Rogan takes her up on this interview, he's had her on the show before, it'll be really interesting to hear her side of the story, what comes out from her perspective. Uh, ben really can't get mad at her at this point because this is the second show that he's gone on uh, to talk about it while he's saying he's not talking about it, which is really interesting. Uh, but what's also funny too is that if this conversation happens with Candace Owens and Joe Rogan, remember Joe Rogan has a massive platform, right? It's the, what the largest podcast or something like that on Spotify. So millions of people are going to hear Candace's side of the story versus how many people watch that interview from um, Dave Rubin or the interview with Pierce Morgan, right? So there's that. And then Joe Rogan will probably, probably be fair and invite Ben Shapiro on to tell his side as well. And then Joe Rogan will agree with whoever is sitting in front of him at that point in time, because <laughs> that's what Joe tends to do. Now, there was a Twitter space with Jeremy Boring, the CEO, and I want to show you something else that was revealed here. This, again, was after Candace's firing. So listen to this piece here. I'd like to ask a little bit more about uh, Candace Owens uh, being fired by the Daily Wire. I just want to preface this to say, like, I was an organizational psychologist for a while. I worked with a lot of organizations that were, quite frankly, larger than the Daily Wire in terms of, you know, helping them with staffing issues, working through the employees to fire, things like that. Jeremy, I'm just wondering, and I guess I'm asking this as a yes or no question, did Candace Owens violate any specific policies at the Daily Wire? And I'm not asking you to tell us which policies. I'm just asking... Was she fired because she violated a company policy? So that question is being asked to Jeremy Boring, again, who is the CEO. I'm not going to make any comment about the Daily Wire separation from Candace Owens in this forum. So that's no, then. Just to be clear with everyone, that's that's no. She did not violate any well, company that, policies. Well, I don't. <laughs> I, very, I don't. Wait, I don't very sneaky, we're not. Let, very let, sneaky let, way let, of describing let, to me let, an answer let, let, that let, I did not give. If, if she violated a company policy, you would have been able to say yes to the question, Jeremy. I know that much. Okay, so Candace is not here. This is not about Candace specifically. Okay, so they were trying to get him to acknowledge whether or not she violated any type of policy. But there's more to that uh, Twitter space as well. Now, this woman here, her name is... Uh, Carlin Borisinko, Borisinko, I, I think I'm pronouncing her incorrectly. Um, she actually says here, I made the Daily Wire CEO admit he won't hire anyone like Candace Owens, who is critical of Israel. This is probably the most damning thing that came from that Twitter space. So listen to this, guys. This is very telling. And it lets you know that Ben Shapiro was lying on Dave Rubin. So basically, that's a, that's a little bit too loud. Okay, so basically what I asked to set this up, is I said, Jeremy, I have a hypothetical question for you. And I'll get the, po the full clip up to YouTube at some point. I said, Jeremy, I have a, a, a hypothetical question for you. If you have in front of you the greatest, like one of the greatest conservative commentators like that you've ever seen, the next Jordan Peterson, this person has a track record of 20 years of a portfolio, you know where they stand. They've been consistent. This person is going to, they've been great on economic issues. They've been great on social issues. This person is going to get millions of views. They're going to sell a whole bunch of books. They're going to do everything you want them to do. They are an excellent business decision. They have a tried and true track record. If you had that person standing in front of you and that person was making some of the same criticisms of Israel that Candace Owens was making, would that person have a job at the Daily Wire? Let me pause. Did everybody hear that? Now, she said if that person had like a 20-year track record, which I don't think Candace Owens even had a 20-year track record uh, at the time that the Daily Wire hired her, 
I, I don't even think Candace is that old. She's, I think she's still fairly young, like in her thirties, right? Okay. So, so just keep that in mind. So basically what she is proposing to him is someone who actually had even more experience than Candace Owens did. Listen to this, listen to what he says. This is very revealing. And so I asked this question and then Jeremy pretended he didn't understand it and he tried to deflect and he tried to say, well, this is about Candace Owens being fired. And I said, no, 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 no. That's not what it's about. This is a hypothetical person. This person this is a fictional person. Does this person have a job at the Daily Wire if they hold the same views as Candace Owens on Israel? Let's listen what happened. Next, Jordan Peterson. going to sell millions of books, going to make you guys millions of dollars getting millions of views on every video they post, but they've made the same criticisms Candace has made in the last six months. Does that person have a job? Yeah, I'm not, even this is too close to the Candace thing for me to speak to because I feel like there are implications of this that I'm not willing to engage in. But if your question is, would I hire, um, you know, would I hire Bill Whittle if Bill Whittle suddenly said uh, that there's a genocide going on in Gaza? No, I don't think that that's a person that I would hire at the Daily Wire. That so you guys heard that, right? So that is the CEO of the Daily Wire basically saying that if you had this person that said there's a genocide going on in Gaza, no, I don't think I would hire that person at the Daily Wire. So doesn't that debunk what Ben Shapiro said in the interview to Dave Rubin, where he said, this is not about Israel. You don't have to have the same views that I have on Israel. This is not about that. That's not, you know, why Candace was fired. Here's the CEO telling you the exact opposite. I don't even, and I told you guys before, I don't agree with Candace Owens on a lot of things politically. I just don't. <laughs> I don't agree with her a lot politically. I consider myself to be more of a socialist. She considers herself to be conservative. So politically, we really do not agree on a lot of things. But just because we don't agree politically doesn't mean that what they're doing isn't bullshit. <laughs> Like, that's the thing. It's bullshit. That doesn't align with very core beliefs for me. I don't want to promote that idea in the world. Why would I give that guy my money? And you, you say make millions of dollars off of these guys. Pause. So you hear what he just said? It does not. He said it does not align with his core beliefs. So again, Ben Shapiro was lying to Dave Rubin when he said, no, you don't have to share the same position on Israel. According to the CEO, you do. As though these hosts generate money and I siphon it off the top, but that's of course not true. I'm an integral part in building the brands of these hosts of promoting the brands of these hosts. I spend millions of dollars of marketing behind every one of my hosts. Uh, I lose a lot of money on my hosts for a long time. Even the ones that are very, very big uh, often make no money at all and cost a lot of money for the first several years that I work with them. Why would I make investments in people if I largely disagree with some major part of their... Uh, in the same sense, I wouldn't hire a, a pro-choice person to work for me. Although, certainly there are conservatives out there who have spotless records on any number of other aspects of what I might consider the conservative platform. I think the difference is, is that obviously if you're conservative, right? Or if you're a conservative publishing company or whatever, obviously there are certain policies that are going to align with conservatism, right? But when it comes to Israel though, that's something that both parties support. Both parties are pro-Israel both parties support the state of Israel, at least the politicians anyway, in DC. But now it's gotten to the point where he is basically saying that if you're not pro-Israel, if you're saying there's a genocide going on in Gaza, if you don't align with him when it comes to the views about Israel, he's saying he would not hire that person. Israel is not the United States of America. Why does someone have to be pro-Israel for you to hire them? This is probably the most damning thing right here is this space. But why would I, why would I pay them when they go against something that I believe uh, at a very deep level, which to me is a somewhat fundamental level? No, I would not.
Ben Shapiro has some explaining to do, right? So if he's letting you know that he wouldn't hire that person, what's stopping him from firing that person? Sam Parker came in with the hit. Sam Parker said, RIP Daily Wire after this. So here we... <laughs> oh my God. Weekend at the Daily Wire. <laughs> they took Weekend at Bernie's. <laughs> So here's Ben Shapiro. And I think that's, I think that is that Jeremy. I think that's Jeremy boring trying to prop up and hold up the daily wire. This is too much. This is too much. And then we have one more final thought here uh, from Candace, which she calls out hypocrisy again. I told you so much hypocrisy. She said, right wing Jews have long decried this evil eye perspective and rightfully so. And yet in the last few years, many of these Jews, the very same one who can't stand when liberals call Donald Trump and every other conservative racist have been calvering, calling people they dislike anti-Semites. There's been a lot of hypocrisy happening, folks. Maybe that conversation with her and Joe Rogan will happen. I don't know. Until then, I guess we'll just have to stick around and see who show Ben pops up on next and says that he doesn't want to talk about it, but talks about it. Let's go to some of the comments here. Uh, Piano Man says, Daily Liar. <laughs> JB says, oh, so now it's not cancel culture. If you don't throw them in jail, they move the goalposts. Thank you, Sparky. Talking fast is often a sign a person knows people don't respect them. They cram their thoughts into a short burst where people hear some of their thoughts before they change to another channel. Brian says, we are getting good at flushing mainstream lies. Yes, Brian, we are doing it. All right, guys, that is it for me today. Thank you for hanging out with me on this Easter Sunday. I actually wasn't expecting to get as many people tuning in because I know some of you spending time with your family and stuff. Uh, but thanks so much for hanging out. I'll be back live again on uh, Tuesday evening. And stay tuned. We got some things, cool things coming up. Uh, for the show uh, this week and going into April. So a lot is coming around the peak. All right, guys, that's it. You know how we do this. Have a good night. Keep up the fight.